2021. Um, it's hard to, to believe I can even say that. Um, but I'm Josie Badger, and I am the RAISE director. And it is so nice to be here with you today and to be on this webinar that I'm really excited about. Um, if you knew RAISE for the past six years, then it's so great to continue working with you. Um, if you're new to RAISE, then welcome. Um, we are the National Technical Assistance Center funded by the Rehab Service Administration for um, transition and supporting parent training and information centers um, to support youth and families throughout transition. And so we are excited to be back and working with you all. Um, as I mentioned, we are funded by RSA and we're on a brand new grant uh, along with eight RSA PTIs. Um, and this webinar today is kind of a foundational starting point for the work that I hope we do throughout the next five years with you all. Um, we found it very important that we all start off with a foundation in some of the key elements that we find so important to working together and serving people. Um, and some of these key elements that we are going to be building onto are the foundations of accessibility, cultural responsiveness, youth engagement, and collaborating. Um, during this time, um, we ask you to use the Q&A box, which there's a little box at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Um, I would ask you to use that um, as questions pop up, and either we will answer them right there, or um, at the end, we will ask Everett. So this conversation today is so important because we know that language can be the gatekeeper to information and who is able to receive that information or not. Um, and so that is why this is where we are starting. And I am absolutely delighted to be introducing our speaker for today, Everett Dibler. Um, Everett and I go way back. Um, and now I'm excited that he is working with Riz as the Riz Youth Engagement Coordinator. Um, along with that work, he also works for the Lee I. Carbon Community College and um, is working on some programs in Pennsylvania to improve advocacy skills for people with disabilities. So Everett, thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Joes. And um, thank you for having me. And um, thank you all for attending today's webinar. I hope that it is informative and um, like Josie said, is a foundation for where we're going to go. Um, for some of you, um, today's content will be somewhat of an overview of things you may already know, and hopefully it'll build on, if you don't, hopefully it'll be build on things that you um, already know and will help you improve your access. Um, as Josie said, um, I work for Lehigh Carmen Community College, and what I primarily do there is advise the college on accessibility of our course content, our facilities, and our website. So uh, a lot of what I'm going to share with you today comes from that expertise, um, but my other passion is working with youth and young adults um, in this space because I myself am a person with a disability uh, who is also a new parent. So um, I, I care about the next generation and where we're going, and I also care about um, making sure that we're providing access to everything that your centers offer because the work you do and the support you provide is so important, but making sure that everyone can access that is super important, not just youth and young adults, but everybody. And so this webinar may, um, like I said, be new information or information you may already know, but this is part of a series of webinars next month in February. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about some of the compliance-related things that you can do in terms of making sure that your website's accessible and that your documents are accessible um, and how they can become more screen reader friendly and what they can do. So hopefully today's webinar will be a building block to that one. So if, hopefully you'll enjoy this one and then want to sign up for uh, the one that's going to happen in February. But for today, we're going to talk about what is accessible language. 
and why is it why is it so important? Then I'm going to talk to you about strategies that you can use in your content and document creation um, to support accessible language and what you can do to really make sure that everything you create is as accessible as possible and kind of what some guiding principles are. And then we're going to look at a very interesting topic that I'm sure some of you are familiar with, the idea of the difference between identity first and person first language. Um, I know that person first language is typically uh, the language as professionals that we're asked to use. Um, but there is a very strong movement within the disability community, especially in some uh, different disability communities, that uh, person first and identity first is different, or that identity first is better. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, too. So we're, we're going to talk about some practical things you can do today and apply today, and then have a more theoretical discussion about person first versus identity first. So what is accessible language? And it's pretty simple. It's when the, language, when the language you use is accessible, it allows people of all ages and ability levels to engage in the content you create. So using simple, accessible language allows everybody that visits your website and your center to gain knowledge and insight from the things that you do. You can apply accessible language to the video scripts that you make. You can apply it to uh, the resources you create, the webinars you do, and anything. So you really will want to use accessible language so that everybody has access to all the great things that you create. We don't want to be putting up barriers to people who are may just be visiting you for the first time, don't really know anything. So the simpler you can put things or the more accessible you can be with your language, the better. But why is this so important? It can benefit all the family members, youth, and stakeholders you connect with through your work, all of them. And if you're using accessible language, it promotes inclusion and community, right? If everybody can access, or as many people as possible can access your information, the more inclusive the community you're creating is, and the bigger network you can create. And you should try to use accessible language across your whole organization. That's why I mentioned you can try to use this and use these principles when you're making a video script when you're having a meeting and inviting people that might not know uh, some of the jargon or some of the language that we're typically using in the professional world. Um, while everyone benefits from using civil language, it is crucial really for those people with low literacy skills, for people with cognitive disabilities, and for those where English is a foreign language. Right? You have people that are coming from all different walks of life and all different kinds of experiences. So the more we can do to use civil language, to address these needs at the door, the better, right? I always tell people here at the college that we should be building everything that we do, our courses, our website, and, and, our, and our facilities with access in mind, right? That's probably like one of the biggest quotes I can have is build and create with access in mind, all right? And that includes the language that you use and the way that you present your information, okay? so. I really can't stress that enough. Um, and you may be saying, Everett, look, we've been a parent center for a long time, and we have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of resources that we currently use regularly that have been there long standing and everything else. What I would encourage you to do is as you're creating new things, start there. Then as you have time, uh, if you're not already doing it this way, if you have time, go back and recreate those resources um, using these principles, right? But you can only start where you can start. So I encourage you to start smart or start small and be smart about when you're going to do it and how you're going to do it and uh, create from there. So now we're going to look at how to support the use of accessible language. And there are a couple different tenets. One is readability. Okay, so using plain language, and, and at the end of this webinar, I'm going to show you um, how to do some of this and ways to check um, some of these things. Um, when you're doing something for the general public, it is good to aim for your content to be at a fifth or sixth grade reading level. Okay, fifth or sixth grade, and I will show you uh, the handout that we have for today's webinar is actually designed that way. So I'm going to pull it up and show you how to check the readability statistics that then show you that this document that I created for the webinar today 
is literally at this level, and you can see how it's simple, but it gets the point across, right? And when you're looking at readability, you want to define acronyms and other jargon, okay? Everybody has been to meetings where you're new uh, to a space, and people are using words and, and acronyms that you have no idea what they are, right? You got, you got VR agency, you got IPE, IEP, right? Even, <laughs> you know, a PTI, you know, what, what is that, right? So, it, so de defining those acronyms and that other jargon is really, really important. And the other thing is that you want to use short, impactful sentences, right? This could even be short sentences in bullets, all right, if you can do that, right? You want to use short, impactful sentences. You don't want to drone on. And I know sometimes if you're writing things, it's like you just want to explain everything and get it all out, and there's so much to say. I encourage you to drill down and really think about what are the most important tenets of this and what do the general public need to know and shorten the sentences and use an active voice. Right? And don't be afraid to have some white space on the paper. It makes it easier for folks to read. Right? So if you're using short sentences and you're using an active voice and you have white space on the page and you're written at a fifth grade or sixth grade reading level, it gives people the ability, the best ability, to access the material that you've been created. Okay. When looking at creating or, or creating documents and using fonts and text, uh, you want to use an easy-to-read font. That could be Arial or Verdana, right? And you want to limit the amount of fonts on a page. So I know sometimes we want to be creative and make things look different and make them stand out, um, but you want to limit how um, creative you get with those different fonts and those different things. When possible, typically in a document this is, Try to use size 14 font or higher. And if you're doing a large print document for somebody, 18 point usually works. And you really want to try to use lower and uppercase letters. Avoid using all caps. And I know um, that sometimes when we're trying to convey importance in something, we'd like, we like to make those all caps. And again, these aren't things that are like compliance related or things that you must do. They're just um, advice little tips that you can use. But I, I always use Arial or Arial Black. I try to. Um, and then I really try to always think about how much I have on a page and what things feel like when I look at them, right? Does this document appear to look overwhelming? Is it a lot of words on a page? Those kind of things. Before I move on to the next piece, I just want to see if there is any, any, um, I know we talk about taking questions at the end, but are there any questions? I see some things popping into yes. the chat. Actually, so yes. I there, there are were questions. Ever, there's uh, one that um, person says, I would like to raise the point that accessibility doesn't mean usability. That's a comment. And okay. another person is asking, what do you mean by active voice? So, that you're talking about what somebody is currently doing, right? Not what they have done. Um, so John writes, or John wrote the paper, or not John has written the paper, right? Does that make sense? Not John has written, it's John writes the paper, right? So it, it takes out some of the unnecessary words. and. Usability and accessibility are, I guess, two different things, but if I can't really use it, I would argue that I really don't know if I can access it, right? So if I can't use your site, then I can't access it either. So it uh, could be that, it, if that makes sense. Yeah, the, um, one thing I want to bring up, Ev, in the chat, this is helpful. So Steve wrote, the active tense would be the British invaded India. The passive would be India was invaded by the British. By the British. That's yeah. a really good example, and thank this is something you. I'm thank not you. very good at. Um, so thank you for that clarifying point. Thank you, Steve. Is there anything else in the chat? Because I just feel like I don't want to be um, drudging on and then having uh, people not be able to ask their questions. No, I think you're on target. Okay. 
So uh, then the next thing is about your page layouts. When you can, you definitely want to use one and a half or two uh, line double space um, when possible, right? So double spacing out your documents and using that and using that the typical half inch margins is really good and trying to use left aligned text, right? Because people naturally read left to right, right? So if you have things where you move things from a center aligned to a left aligned, back to a center, then to a right or a left align, it can feel a little bit overwhelming and confusing. Um, but, but like I said, when it comes to some of this, it is literally just stepping back from what you did and kind of getting a feel for what the document feels like in terms of um, the way that it looks and does it feel overwhelming. And sometimes, because we are so close to the work that we're doing, we can forget these things because we get so passionate and so into what we're doing. And Josie just said she's not really good at active versus passive voice, right? And it is a skill and it's hard to master how to do this. And so it is a simple concept, um, but yes. And then the other thing that I would say about page layout, and you see this especially right now uh, in the virtual world um, that we're living in, that people are having hyperlinks for Zoom meetings or websites to access information. You see these really, 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 really long URLs um, that drudge on, it feels like, for lines and lines, depending on what it is. So I would encourage people to try to use descriptive hyperlinks. An example of this would be, uh, for more information, visit the RAISE Center website, right? So the RAISE Center website is a different if you actually go to the Ray Center, it doesn't just say that. So you would copy the website and then hyperlink it and then change the words. And I can show people um, how to do that if they would like at the end of this also. But using those descriptive hyperlinks makes it easier for everyone to know where they're going and what it is. Um, and so you want to make sure that the way you're writing your things lends itself to ending that way. Um, so that you, when you're writing, it says things like, example, for more information, visit the, visit the RAISE website. Typically, you'll see, um, for more information, go to this link, and then they post the really long URL. Um, that is not only inaccessible to people that have difficulty with reading or accessible language, but it is also difficult for those that use, utilize uh, screen readers or other assistive devices. And so the more we can eliminate those long URLs, uh, the better. And there's been, and I know people use tiny, URL, tiny URLs or bit.ly's to display information, but I always try to use descriptive uh, hyperlinks when I'm looking at page layout. Okay. Yeah, there's a question. Do you sure. recommend this or these tips for professional emails as well? Yes. As absolutely. If, if you can, I think that uh, access is um, you know, I, I think it's a culture, right? I think that access can become part of your culture or being accessible or being usable, right? So if you're um, sending an email in a larger organization, you don't know who, what employee, who's going to read that, where it's going to get to, and the more you can do these kind of things uh, within your daily life, um, the better. Um, the next webinar that we do next month will focus a lot on how to create documents in a way that's like stream reader accessible and to other people that use assistive devices. But yes, I would recommend trying to do this um, in all of your communications if you can, where it almost becomes a habit for what you do. And then you can teach others what that means and how to do it and what to do. And then everybody's doing that. And it actually will, um, you'll probably look at your emails and go, that, that, even, that, feels, that feels nicer or it feels warmer or it feels like people um, can engage with what I'm saying, right? Uh, you can ask Josie, and she might laugh when I say this, but um, I, I like to talk a lot, and I like to write a lot in my emails. And I literally had to teach myself how to trim down the questions that I'm asking, the, the way that I'm posing them, because the person that's reading those emails and those different things might not know what you mean if it sounds too complicated. So keeping your emails simple and to the point 
and concise to where someone can understand and then give you the right, you know, provided the answer or support that you're looking for. Sometimes it makes it hard to do that when, if your emails are too long and too wordy. Okay. This next one is uh, pretty, uh, again, <clears throat> pretty simple, but I, I have heard um, people that I work with here, other places say that this makes, that this can make your content boring or by using, you know, limiting the use of the colors that you use. Um, you, but you want to use high contrast colors, right? Black text on a white background is best, and you want to avoid using pastel or neon colors, right? Uh, and I was guilty of this um, early in my career where, you know, you make a flyer and you print it on, I don't know, um, fluorescent yellow paper, and you hang it everywhere, right? And then, you know, it, it, it pops off. People can see the yellow paper. People can see um, the things that you're showing them or you think they can. And then somebody tries to read it, and it's actually, it could be hard to read. Or if it's like a, um, so avoiding those pastel colors. Actually, yellow and black is probably a bad example I just gave because black on a yellow background is good or yellow with uh, yellow text on a black background is also good for uh, color contrast. And at the next webinar that we're having next month, I'll actually show you, show you how you can analyze um, what is good color contrast. What does it mean and how can you measure it and what kind of tools can you use that are out there that are free that can show you how uh, to build good color contrast in what you do. Um, and making sure that your web developers and people that are doing that, um, that your brands are good colors that are gonna feel that are going to be good contrast for when you're creating other materials. That's a big thought about marketing and materials and the colors that you use. Um, the Rays logo that I'm looking at here is a good one too. Um, the green on white would be a good contrast. Right, so, um, or white on green uh, is a really good contrast. So, is there, is there any question? Th those are some real basic um, things to consider when you're thinking about this stuff. And before we get to, I was going to show a video here next about this idea of identity first versus person first, but I will um, get out of this for a second and just show people uh, where to check the readability in a Word document. Okay. Yeah, before you go there, there's a question. I don't know, maybe you're going to address it on the next webinar, but it's... Uh, okay, go ahead. Well, while while yeah. I'm getting this ready, I'll try to do that. How's that? Okay. Do you have any tips on how to select which hyperlinks to include or embed? And this person asked this because the New York City Department of Ed and similar go-to resources are constantly updating their websites, making some URLs inaccessible. So you mean that when, is the question referring to when you click them, um, they don't go anywhere? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean, is, is that what they mean? I hope that's, am I getting that yeah, right? Yeah, I think that, yes. They said yes, but um, the links are dead. And that okay. is a problem. So you definitely, well, and there is, um, there are, and, and I, all, all I can say is um, what, one of the biggest things about uh, web accessibility that uh, you, you can contact with a company that will support you to do, uh, looking at making sure your website is accessible and doing all that and making sure everything is in compliance and all of that. And one thing that a lot of companies will do is help you monitor and check for those dead links. Um, there is some part of this that is uh, web upkeep or um, making sure that your website is up to date and current with the newest information. And unfortunately, uh, a, a dead hyperlink is a, a possibility. Um, but I would say when you're communicating with people, you want to make sure that they can click on the website and know where they're headed to. Right, and a descriptive hyperlink is a way to eliminate that long URL to make it more easier to read for those trying to access the information. Um, I have seen people put a description of what the URL is and then put the long URL, which I guess you could say is okay, um, but I do try to apply um, using descriptive hyperlinks 
in all that I do. Um, and people, you know, and then our office, I, you know, I work in disability support services and we uh, constantly joke about people that do that, then I call them out. So that's kind of how this works. Um, so did I see other questions pop in? I can, all I see is the chat is, is orange on my end. Are there other questions? Not at the moment. Okay, okay. So how to check readability. Um, if you're in a Word document, okay, can you all see the Word document? Yes? I'm just checking with everybody. Yes. Can you see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so if you go to file, there's all the way at the bottom. And of course, let me just say this. <laughs> a lot of the access things that are available um, are buried somewhere away, and you have to activate them. Now, I will, I say that to also say um, that uh, platforms like Google, uh, Microsoft, Zoom, um, because there is such a big push right now for accessibility based on compliance, um, these products are changing regularly and improving their, uh, their interface and their uh, awareness of access for people. Uh, but if you're in a, in a Word document, you click the word options and you get this lovely dialogue box. And on the left hand side, there are there's a menu for general, display, proofing, size, language, advance, all these things down here. If you click proofing right here um, at the bottom, there is a checkbox for show readability statistics. And so because I do the work that I do here, that's always checked and I check it. Um, for things that uh, we put out here, or get put out that I know of. Um, so that's how that works. And then what happens is when you go to your review up here in the, the ribbon up here, there is this button for check spelling and grammar. Okay, so when that checkbox is activated, it will automatically check your, when you click check spelling and grammar, it will say that everything is fine. Hit OK, and then you get this other dialog box. And um, you'll see that at the very bottom are readability statistics. So there are two different ways to look at this. The easiest way to tell is that this document is at a 5.6 grade level. So it is literally, and I tried to shoot for grade five or six. I didn't really realize that I was literally going to get right in the middle between, between grades five and six when doing this. Um, so that was luck of the draw, but you can see that I created a handout that uh, you all get access to. That's kind of like a tip sheet for the things uh, that we talked about today um, so that um, you can post it in your office. On a filing cabinet, um, we have them. We have things like this laminated all over my campus uh, in offices just to remind people to think about this. Again, because this is, this is not a compliance-related thing. This is a, a choice of developing a culture that, uh, that is allowing people to access and use all the resources that you uh, have created, okay? Is there any questions? There's a question. Is that okay. available also in PowerPoint? I mean, the readability function. Uh, not. I, I actually checked that today. There is uh, an access checker within PowerPoint where you can see where things are and how they are laid out. And I will go over a lot of that uh, during, I hate to keep saying like, at the next webinar, but I guess it is like a self-promotion for the next webinar. So I will go over some of that um, during our next training and kind of show you where that where those things are too. So hopefully this is encouraging you to sign up on uh, February 16th, I believe it is, right? That's your commercial break for the yes. day. Okay, <laughs> awesome. Um, <clears throat> so if I go back to um, the PowerPoint, But I guess, I guess to answer your question more explicitly, I don't believe there, there is, but there are different ways to look at access and to make sure what you're doing is accessible to the most people, and I'll show you how that works. 
So going back to this, actually, you know what, we'll show a video here instead. So we're going to show this uh, video quickly and make sure that it's ready. You've probably been told that it's wrong to use someone's disability as a label. That because people are more than their disability, it's better to say person with epilepsy rather than an epileptic. Person first language places the person ahead of their disability. A person with traumatic brain injury. A person with schizophrenia. And many individuals prefer to be referred to in this way. A survey of Facebook users with disability elicited the following responses. 100% person first. We are not defined by what others suppose to be deficits. All are differently unique. All people should be known by who they are, not what they are. Person first. I may be bipolar, but I would rather people judge me for me, not my illness. I usually like people to say a person who is blind, not a blind person. I am a person first, blind second. But there are also individuals who prefer that the disability or disorder come first in the description. This is often called identity first language. I have cerebral palsy and I prefer identity first language. I consider my disability to be an inextricable part of my identity as a human being. It isn't negative to say I'm disabled. It's a statement of fact. My disability is a huge part of my identity and how I experience the world. To me, person first language implies a degree of shame or negativity about disability. I embrace my disability because it influences so much of how I see and experience the world. In particular, there's a preference for identity first language in the deaf community and the autism community. I am autistic. I cannot remove autism from my body. It is my neurotype. Just as I am tall, I am autistic. I do not have tallness. It makes being tall sound negative that way. Saying I have autism separates the autism from me. It makes autism sound negative. People can have cancer, but cancer is viewed as negative and separate from the person. I am autistic. I am tall too. Identity first. Disability is part of who I am. It's helped me grow as a person and brings me together with a community. Also, it's not my health that disables me. It's society's unwillingness to accommodate us. In respect of these two viewpoints, I often switch between person first and identity first language when I'm speaking in general. But the most important thing when advocating for someone is to find out how they like to be described and addressed. I think you're muted, Everett. Ev, you're still muted. Well, there's no sound. Am, am I okay now? Yes. Okay, I had my I had my handset and Zoom on the computer muted, so that it wouldn't make any noise. Okay. Thank you, Joe. So, and I, and I just said, I, you know, with all of 2020 and being in Zoom land, you think I know exactly what to do all the time. Um, but, of course, uh, we stay muted. So, looking at this video that we just watched, um, we'll go into kind of a video recap. And then I saw some other questions that came up uh, in the chat, too, um, while we were sitting here. So... This is an interesting conversation for me, person first versus identity first. Um, in my experience, uh, working in the field, like I said, I believe that everybody would say that um, the majority of the professional space would say that it is 
appropriate to uh, use person first. Um, but there are um, definite communities in the disability community um, that autism being one, um, where there is a great debate of identity first versus person first. And some people are not aware of um, this aspect of the disability community and sometimes catch themselves uh, in, in a weird space because you used uh, a term or the way to define something in an incorrect way according to someone. So I think the video gives um, really good examples of or a really good strategy of just asking the person what they would prefer um, when you feel like you're in a space where you're not really sure. Uh, and then if you did make a misstep, obviously apologize. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I know uh, for me personally, um, I do also bounce um, between both uh, depending on uh, the space that I'm in. On a personal level, um, it for me, it depends on who I'm around and how well do I know you, right? Um, but if you use the proper, uh, if you're using person-first language or identity-first language, uh, I think it shows to the community um, that you're at least thinking about this. It's when you don't use any of these um, that people will, and I know that I have done this almost, you know, in the past, uh, almost like shut someone out because I felt like they didn't understand or they must not get it. And so, and again, these ideas of um, creating content with um, access in mind or doing something and making sure that something is usable or attainable um, is really a culture and using the proper language and it, it opens doors for people um, to be a part of your center and the community that, you, that you're serving, right? And if you're working with young adults and their parents, you want them to feel welcome to come to where you are when this COVID situation is over. You want them to come visit and be a part and be engaged. And so um, but during this time, it is so important to be thinking about how things are presented and what people may uh, perceive. Um, I saw uh, an, another question in here um, about companies that may offer some of this support with like dead links or uh, different things. And there are a ton of these companies um, popping up because there is a move um, with web accessibility being a major piece of uh, concern um, for big organizations and small ones. So a company that I would recommend to help with this possibly would be Site Improve is one. Is that um, S-I-T-E? Yes, as in Site Improve, yes. Site Improve. Um, what they offer, there's obviously prices for it. It is, I mean, I will say they are a little bit pricey, um, but they are um, quite effective at helping you to monitor your dead links. Now, it depends. Your um, website provider, the people that manage your website may offer this as well, but if they don't, uh, a place to go would be uh, Site Improve. Um, and there's, there's others, but I really do think that might be a good spot for where um, PTIs are and where you would want to like put and allocate your money um, because the college is using some um, and that seems to be the most cost effective. Yeah. Um, is, there, is there any other questions or any thoughts about the use of uh, mm -hmm. identity, identity first versus person first? Yeah, there are some, a couple of comments and one question. Somebody asked if the video is embedded in the slides. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. I just, uh, un I just played it off of YouTube because that's better audio quality for, um, for the Zoom webinar. 
And, and the other one is, um, what would be an example of not using either identity or person first language? Um, if someone would call me for, I can't even say the word. So someone saying, uh, you're handicapped or um, you're uh, crippled. Right? Or even the disabled girl. Yes, or dis yes. Instead, person with a disability. But yeah, so so. I I think Ev, you've mentioned this, but the most common one I hear is the person with autism or an autistic person. Um, yes. And and deaf as well, um, because it's about identity and so always default is ask the person if a person's not there to ask then i i tend to go person first yes but i but it, you know but it, you know but but josie knows this because you know she knows me uh i am comfortable with being called things that would be personally um being referred to by my family and friends in other ways, right? Like that's whatever. But defaulting the person first initially is probably the best bet, but, or asking the person, you know, just ask the person. Is there any other questions? There are a lot of questions and you've brought up a lot of it. Let me see if um, I know Lauren or Miriam mentioned that you will be hitting on some of this stuff in the next webinar. Um, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. So here's one, and you or I can answer this. Um, it was mentioned that sometimes certain terms, such as those used in special ed, will actually like bump the reading level, a grade level up. Do you want to talk about what you do in those? situations on reading levels like you mean like when you're using terms within special education and they're like really long words and then it just bumps it up um what what i have done in the past is try to if possible um without having any concrete example of kind of what you mean it's almost like you're simplifying what that process is right like if you're Using the word assessment, they're going to do a transition assessment, right? And assessment is a pretty large word that people have trouble defining or understanding. You may want to just say they're going to do some work or they're going to look into aspects of their life in this way, or they're going to explore or like using different words to explain what exactly the assessment is assessing and almost not using that big word, if that makes sense. Do you feel like I got at that, Joe? Did I answer that? <laughs> um, yes, I think you got a big piece of it. And um, when I was part of the National Youth Leadership Network eons ago when I was a youth, um, something we would do is if there was a term, I'm gonna, just gonna throw out here LRE, Least Restrictive Environment. We, um felt that that term was very important for people to know, but we would put like a definition after it um, and explain it better. The other thing that I think is really helpful is that when you're doing your spell check, you can highlight in Word the paragraph that you're checking um, and the sentences that you're checking and break it down so you can find exactly where the the grade level is being bumped. And so that has actually been very helpful for me. Thank you, Jess. There is an interesting comment or kind of question here. Do you think it's appropriate to include your preference of identity or person first in your professional signature, like we do with gender pronouns? What do you recommend? To me, that to me that's a that's a personal choice, but that's um, definitely something that uh, people could consider. And 
you may recommend it to people that you're working with um, if um, they are ha they're having discussions about this with you. Um, it would definitely be helpful for them to help people understand. And I see that, uh, is it Diana had a question that, or um, the problem with not using some big words is about they're gonna see things in literature and understand that. Uh, and is that doing them a disservice to try to use simple words? Um, I can, I, I, I see the, the thought perspective there, uh, but when you're looking at um, access to it's almost like you're opening the door to someone, right? So that would also be considering your audience though too. Um, if you know you want them to learn, or you want people to learn these very important concepts or terms, it may be really important to use them, um, but then find a way to explain them in a way where people can grasp that information and those uh, concepts. So I'm not saying don't ever use big words, but if you're going to, and that will bump up your readability, I understand that. But if you can find a way to explain those concepts in simple terms where they can learn the big words or the difficult words um, that are necessary, and but also have the ability to know and understand them in a real way. Okay. There's another question, I think it's interesting. Would it be good to default to person first and acknowledge identity first as well, together? And another one similar, when developing publications, PowerPoints, etc., default to person first language, correct? Yes. I mean, that, that, would, that, would, be my, that would be my thought and it's what I do. Um, yes, um, but I, but I also, I mean, maybe it's that you would explicitly state somewhere in your organization that, hey, we use person first language here in all of our publications. If you prefer to be addressed otherwise, and I'm not sure what policy that should go into or what party or that can go into, but I think that it would be, uh, wise to illustrate that. Um, I have worked for independent living centers that uh, have expressed that where we that when you come to our office, this is how we handle things and what we do. Um, but if you're doing a general publication, I would still say that person first is a good default because it at least shows that you're you're trying to be aware because so many places are not right. And I'm not even talking about PTIs. I just mean society in general. You know, you have your newspapers, your news media, right? They make missteps all the time. I think that's, I think if there's not any more questions, I think that's all. I hope everybody will sign up for February and we'll take like a deeper dive into some of the more of the um, like practical ways that you can do things to make things more accessible. Um, for people, and um, I welcome any feedback. We want to make sure these are um, hitting on topics that you find important and useful, and I would personally appreciate the feedback also. Yeah, the feedback is coming from a um, survey that we will pop up once the webinar is over. Completed. Yeah, so number one, thank you so much, Ev. Um, really appreciate a lot of great information. Um, we're already getting some great feedback in the chat. Um, the Once this webinar is finished, we will obviously stop the recording. And it takes a little bit to, for it to process, then it will be sent to be captioned. So I would expect the recording to be sent out by the end of this week. Um, but we do ask you that um, to fill out the survey. That's super, super helpful for us um, as we move forward. And we are so grateful that you joined us today. Um, please look us up online at raisecenter.org. And we are also on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and look us up there. So thanks, everyone. And I will talk to you in a month. Bye, everyone.